Hi there, my name's Guy, you're watching Midwinter Minis, and this video has been very kindly sponsored by Audible. Today I've got another retro painting episode for you, and I'm going to be painting up something quite special indeed, chatting to a Warhammer legend and supporting a fantastic charity at the same time. Believe it or not, this chunky little chap is the first ever Space Marine Terminator. Sculpted way back in 1987 and designed to be the most intimidating, heavily armoured infantry unit in Games Workshop's flagship sci-fi tabletop game, Warhammer 40,000. Given that Terminators are one of the most iconic units in 40k, being featured in every version of Space Hulk board games and video games for over 30 years, you'd think more would be known about the early models, especially the first prototypes like this. Before the Space Marine Terminators, clad in tactical dreadnought armour, started to have a standardised design with the release of the first Terminator box set, the Citadel sculptors prototyped a few models in close succession in 1987, which were released as models and appeared in consecutive issues of White Dwarf in 1988. This particular model is known to collectors as the Cobra, or Turtle Design. The arguably better known model with the giant pauldrons is known as the Saturnine, and the third model, well, that poor boy hasn't even got a nickname. Let's call him Steve. These models were, let's say, a bit more esoteric in their design than the refined, indomitus pattern terminators we know today, but all we really know about them is who sculpted them. Jez Goodwin and Bob Naismith, two Games Workshop legends who, alongside artist John Blanche, were instrumental in creating the visual identity of Warhammer. Goodwin and Naismith created the first Space Marine and Chaos Space Marine models, the first Tyranid models, the Gene Stealers, and the first Eldar models. I mean, the first Eldar models still look pretty amazing, and even though a lot of the current range is almost 30 years old, they still hold up beautifully. While Jez Goodwin's designs tend to be quite refined and sleek, stylistically, Bob Naismith's models leaned more towards the grim and grotesque. So just from this catalogue entry of all three models, you could probably guess who made what, but later issues of White Dwarf clarified all that. Yes indeed, the Cobra Terminator was designed by Bob Naismith. So who better to ask about the model and the history of Terminators in Warhammer 40k than the man himself. Hello there everybody, yes, Bob Naismith here, and I was the designer and the sculptor for Games Workshop slash Citadel back in the late 80s, and yes, that Terminator is one of mine. Awesome. Would you mind if I picked your brains about this model and the Rogue Trader era? Yep, fire away, just bring it on. Amazing. I'll drop in and out of my interview with Bob Naismith as I prep and paint this fantastic old Terminator for you. This is also the perfect time to bring up the sponsor of this video, Audible. Whenever I'm hobbying, I love to listen to an audiobook. I never find the time to read physical books, as there's always something else I could be doing, especially with these two little monkeys wriggling about. <coughs> Hobby time and audiobooks just go hand in hand for me these days. While I worked on this project, I listened to The Forever War by John Haldeman. While Starship Troopers is often given as one of the main inspirations for the Space Marines found in Warhammer 40k, and they certainly inspire the tough, unflinching, militaristic aspects of the Adeptus Astartes, the indomitable elite soldiers of the Forever War face inner turmoil, doubt, and desperate futility. It's interesting to see how all of these themes have collided in the grimdark universe of Warhammer 40k. For what it's worth, I really enjoyed the Forever War, and some of it's quite prophetic considering it's almost 50 years old. And if you're interested in checking it out and trying out Audible with a 30-day free trial, head to audible.com slash midwinterminis or text midwinterminis to 500-500. You get one credit every month to spend on whatever you want, and once you've bought it, it's yours to keep even if you cancel your membership one day. There's loads of other great free stuff to enjoy when you're a member of Audible too. Podcasts, comedy programs, original dramas, even bedtime stories. Again, get a free month of Audible on me at audible.com slash midwinterminis. Now, let's take a closer look at this model. This model was done pre-Space Hulk as a tester piece. Rogue Trader, as it originally was known, was still in development. We were still play testing it on Rex carpet and really we just needed models. We had a studio at um, Enfield Chambers at the time. We as designers were left pretty much to ourselves in terms of 3D stuff. We'd get very loose instruction from someone like Alan Merritt or Rick Priestley or Brian Ansell. Make me some dwarves or make me some chaos warriors or make me some this, that or the next thing. We were very much involved with making lots and lots of stuff for Warhammer. There wasn't really a huge amount of focus on science fiction. I, at that time, was the person who was nominally in charge of the designers. I was the design manager. If someone wanted a model and none of the other designers really wanted to pick it up, then it was really down to me to do something. 
this really was one of those kind of models where we knew that we wanted to have these heavy versions of Space Marines. At that time, I think Halliwell had just started doing work on Space Hulk which was obviously the first place that the Terminators were really seen. They were game designers and stuff. They would they would describe it from their side. Big, strong, look heavy. It's got to look like it could take out a gene stealer. It needs to have the double bolt gun fitted to it and a power glove. That was pretty much it. This Terminator model would have obviously come on a 25mm slaughter base. Unlike the 40mm versions its chunkier 21st century counterparts come with, but it would be a shame not to be able to use this cool little model in all versions of the game, so I'm going to give it a double base. I mixed up a bit of milliput and stuck two tiny neodymium magnets underneath a 25mm base, pressed them up against my tabletop to make sure they were flush and let them dry. Later on I'll attach magnets to the underside of a 40mm base, now though it's time to clean up the model. I carefully snapped and prized apart the model so that we've got the arms separated and the carapace cover away from the body revealing a big hole in the torso. I'm sure Bob could shed some light on why that was necessary. The carapace that went on the top was uh, an addition to increase the menace and the presence of the model. I dare say that when you look at it, you even see the beginnings of what a Titan would look like. I made those models as well. There's a thing about metal toy soldiers at the time. That was the cost of the metal. Very often, the volume would double if you increase the, the height of the model by maybe only 5% or 10%. And I think at that time, we were paying between three to five thousand pounds a metric ton. So the number of figures you could get out became critical, really, you know. So the idea of taking a model like this one and putting the carapace on meant that you could make the model bigger. So it was a commercial thing. To start things off, I gave the model a quick swish in acetone to help shift the remnants of the paint this model had in its creases. Citadel minis from the 80s were made from a lead alloy, so while it would melt plastic models, acetone won't harm this at all. Once I was finished cleaning them off, I gave all of the parts a little dunk in water just to neutralise the acetone. I dried the bits off and glued the carapace back on the body using superglue, but I want to leave its arms off just for now because there's some nice little details on the side of the body that I want to be able to paint without the arms getting in the way. I drilled a couple of small holes within the arm sockets and mounted them on stretched out paper clips. I usually use blue tack to stick models to my little plastic cups for painting, but this model is quite heavy, so I used some double sided tape. In retrospect, I should have applied the basing material before I did this because it gets a bit messy in a sec. I cut off the tab from the base of the mini, sacrilege I know, and then super glued him to the 25mm base. I also super glued a couple of aquarium gravel stones in place to look like little rocks, and then covered the base in slightly watered down PVA. To get that retro look, I then sprinkled sand onto the base, which obviously stuck to the double sided tape as well. I didn't really think this through, huh? Using another 25mm base as a negative template, I also applied the same basing materials to the outer rim of a 40mm base. And after it was dry, I could then remove it to leave the space for this Terminator's base to slot in without sand getting in the way. Now the basing stuff was dry, I could also scrape away the excess sand that was touching the Terminator's feet, the base rim, and the rocks using a toothpick. This is soft enough to scrape the metal model without damaging it. Okay, prime time. To give the model a bit more protection, I used Krylon Multi-Surface Grey Primer. Just a light dusting to preserve as much of that hand sculpted detail as possible. It's so light you can still see the shininess of the metal underneath. Now there's a thin plastic coating to work with. I could then use white plastic primer from above, which should adhere to it nicely. Nice and bright on the top, with grey still left on the underside. Now let's talk about colours. For the paint job, I think the most appropriate choice would be Crimson Fists, the poster boy chapter for the Rogue Trader era. Looking at the cover art, although the armour is obviously blue, there's a touch of purple in the shadows. Now, I try to use vintage colours as much as I can in these retro painting videos, but I don't really have anything like that in my collection. So for the base coat I mixed Vallejo's Royal Purple and Dark Prussian Blue, about 50-50. Thinned it well, and airbrushed it onto the body and arms. Airbrushing base coats is a great way of preserving details, so you get good colour coverage without the danger of paint settling in the recesses. I also added a drop of Coat Darm's Lupin Grey into the airbrush pots to lighten up the colour for the top-down highlights. To do some quick and dirty recess shading, I mixed Vallejo's Black Wash with Citadel's Drakenhof Nightshade in equal quantities, and used a detail brush to apply it to all of the little sunken details on the armour. Time to crack out some 30-year-old paint! Mixing Enchanted Blue with Dark Prussian Blue and thinning it down with water, I glazed on some highlights on the armour. This also fixed any splodges and little mistakes I made with the shade paint earlier. 
I then mixed a drop of white ink into that blue on my palette and started sketching out some fat edge highlights. These might look a bit clumsy at the moment, but I'll smooth them out later. Now, given the sequential reveals of the three prototype Terminators in White Dwarf in 1988, I was actually interested to know if that's when they were designed too. Slightly earlier, I guess. I wouldn't say it's one of the last things I've made, not by a long chop, but it was it was in the in the closing sequence of my sculpting for Games Workshop at that point. There was no art for anything like that. You were left as a almost a free spirit. So that design was entirely my design. It wasn't anybody else's design. I made this figure around about the same time as Jez made a couple of other Terminator proposals. You know, there's that one with the Terminator that he did with the huge spheroid shoulder pads. That was Jez's first go at it. The models on the table they have several functions. One of the functions is to be easily understood from a distance. If you're playing 40k, the chances are that the closest you'll get to your miniatures is three or four feet. So you've got to be able to identify quite easily what they are, what they're armed with. You also want to be rewarded by what they look like from the back. If it's your model and you've painted it and you put it on the table, you'll spend all day watching its back. So the rear view has to be reasonably entertaining for you. So there was always an effort to put some detail on the back that would be nice to paint. I mean, to be honest, I am having a lot of fun painting the back of this model. Now, time to paint that crimson power glove. I don't actually have a wide variety of reds in my collection. It's one of the colours I can't see very well, so I tend to lean more towards fiery reds than deep crimsons and wine colours. But I do have Mephiston red, so I gave the fist two thin coats. Also, the gun arm has a forearm mounted twin bolter, and this is Retro Hammer, so I painted the casing on that too. Using Vallejo black wash again, I lined the recesses of the red areas to give the armour plate some depth. Then, mixing in the old Citadel paint Blood Red with Mephiston Red, I started highlighting the armour, mostly on the top facing parts, but also along the edges of the armour panels, and fixed up any areas I'd touched with the black wash accidentally. Now the bulk of the armour has had a bit of attention, I don't want to go too far without base coating some of the other details in case I make a mess and have to fix the armour again. So using vintage mithril silver, I painted the grill on the mouth, some of the techie armour details, the gun barrels, and the ribbed under armour at the top of the legs. Now, I find the coat d'armes ink armour wash dries a little bit glossy, and while glossy finishes were pretty common back in the Road Trader days, just look at these shiny, shiny dark angels, I wanted a bit more of a matte look, so I tried out the regular black ink wash to see what that was like. Shading all of the areas I just painted silver, and yeah, I think it works pretty well, not nearly as glossy. I then went back to Mithril Silver and a detail brush to pick out a few select highlights on the silver parts. The body armour has a couple of lights on the torso. I want them to be bright, desaturated yellow, so to make it pop against the dark armour, I base coated them carefully with white acrylic ink. And after practising on the lights, I held my breath and did the eyes too. Now, I don't want to accidentally get green all over the legs of this model after I've done all the detail work, so before I carry on, I gave the bases an all over coat of Vallejo Intermediate Green. It has great opacity, and will work nicely as an undercoat for the old Citadel Goblin Green paint in a minute. Okay, yellow time. A tiny touch of sunburst yellow on the lights, and that's it. For the eyes, I thought a purpley pink would work quite well for the rest of the colours here, so using Coat d'Arm's Warlock Purple, thinning it down to a glaze, I gave the eyes a touch of colour. Not really a problem if the paint touches the edges of the eye here. It's so thin it'll just give it a light purple tone on the top of the blue, kind of like if it was glowing. Back to the white ink. I made a tiny touch in the middle of each light, and then the lightest, most careful brush stroke I could muster on the eye lens to make them glint a little bit. Okay, time to refine this armour. I diluted Citadel Enchanted Blue down to a glaze and added a tiny touch of white ink to lighten it up a bit, but not quite as bright as my first edge highlight colour, and started smoothing out the areas between the old edge highlights and the regular armour blue. This kind of softens the hard edge of my quick and dirty highlights and makes them look much more smooth when the paints dry. Here's what it looks like before and after. The left leg has been smoothed out with the Enchanted Blue glaze, but the right leg is still what it looked like before. Quite effective, huh? Now, while most old Space Marines from the Rogue Trader era didn't have the same huge chapter emblems on their armour like modern Marines do, this picture of the Terminator from White Dwarf does have a couple of tiny, old-school Ultramarine emblems. To be honest, I think having a big Crimson Fist is a good indicator that you are a Crimson Fist, so let's do something a bit more interesting. Time to switch out to the smallest brush I have, Squidmars XS, and try some freehand. 
There's a recurring theme in the old Road Trader book of things having kill, kill, kill emblazoned on them, with only one L. Who knows why, but kind of like it. So I'll write that across one shoulder pad. Hmm. I think the tip on this is actually just too tiny. The paint is already dry before I can touch it to the surface. I switch back to the medium-sized brush. The tip is still very fine, but the paint stays moist in the brush for long enough to actually paint. Before we tidy that up with some blue paint, let's switch to the other shoulder pad, and there's just enough space for a tiny skull. I sketched on a quick skull shape, just a blob and a smaller blob underneath it. And now with the enchanted blue, I marked out the placements of the eye holes, the nose holes, and sketched on some rough teeth. A little bit of back and forth between the white and the blue, always using very thin paint, tidying up, fixing mistakes, and it looks okay. I was worried it would end up looking a bit like Boney from Trapdoor. Oh dear. Okay, let's finish this. An all over coat of goblin green on the base, and then a dry brush of sunburst yellow over the top when that was dry. For the little stones, I base coated them with intermediate grey and built up some highlights stippling on pale sand. Did someone say pale sand? I snapped the arms off their mounts and glued them onto the body with super glue. When it was dry, I painted the rim of the base with goblin green again to tidy up the yellow dry brushing. And let's quickly sort out this step up base. I placed the Terminator bottom up with the 40mm base on top, nicely centered, and then I dropped two more magnets on top, letting them find their places by themselves and super glued them in place. I painted it up to match the base on the Terminator, and we're done. I've got to say, I'm pretty happy with how this turned out. What do you think, Bob? Oh, jeez, guy, that's brilliant. I love that. Yes, indeed. Amazing. Now, there's obviously a lot more going on with this model than, say, the early 90s Space Marines. And as it was a prototype model, the details and proportions weren't quite as refined, but I really enjoyed painting it. It's packed with character and has loads of fun features to work on. I always like to be as efficient as I could. I would make a model like that reasonably quickly. And you can see that it's a very facile model. If Jez had made it, it would probably have taken two or three times longer. But arguably, it would probably have been two or three times better. Jez's finish and his attention to detail is greater than mine. And it was just after that, really, that he started making the Terminator Marines that became the kind of hallmark. So really, at that point, the ball was pretty much firmly handed over to Jez. You've got to say it worked. So given that Jez Goodwin's second design ultimately evolved into the current Terminator design, and the silhouette of his first try, the one people call the Saturnine Terminator, obviously inspired the silhouette of the Custodes Telemon Dreadnought, as well as loads of super-armoured infantry models from third-party sculptors, do you think Games Workshop might reimagine this Terminator design and re-release it? It's quite possible. The Master, I'm sure, is probably somewhere in the archives uh, at Lenton. They'll be looking down the corridor to see if there was anything. I don't have anything really to do with Workshop now anymore. In Workshop, I've got some fantastic sculptors, much better than I am. So good luck to them. Well, thank you so much for getting involved, Bob. It's been an absolute pleasure to chat. And if you're wondering what the good Mr. Naismith is up to these days, he is still sculpting. And I would definitely recommend checking out his work. He has a Patreon campaign where he posts monthly model downloads, but if you prefer just to buy specific STLs for 3D printing, his website, bobnaismith.com, has a store where you can find all sorts of awesome sci-fi stuff, from human troopers to heavy infantry, terrain and bases, spaceship interiors, civilians and twisted alien monsters, and loads of cool vehicles. They all have a nice contemporary look too, sort of a halfway between the chunky heroic scale of Warhammer and the more sleek, realistic look of games like Infinity. I'll leave links to Bob's store and his Patreon page for you to check out if you're in the market for awesome sci-fi STLs. Now, you might be wondering about that price tag in the thumbnail for this video. That's not what these models sell for, surely? Well, thankfully, no. You can still pick these models up for between 20 and 50 pounds on eBay. The money in the thumbnail is basically what this model's value is to me as a creator here on YouTube, but also to a charity that I'm supporting with this video, Calm, the campaign against living miserably. You see, I'm tallying up everything this video has made, from the very kind Audible sponsorship, the actual YouTube ad revenue this video generates, and also the sale value of the model, which at the time this video is released is currently sitting on eBay. Basically, I'm giving 50% of whatever the total in the thumbnail is to the charity Calm. Depending on the country you live in, between 60 and 90% of all suicides are male. And as difficult as it is, that's a topic that needs to be discussed. And that's what Calm does. They specialize in offering support to men in their darkest hour, from crisis support to spreading mental health awareness in the community, and I'm very proud to do what I can to support them. The other 50% I'm keeping. 
this is my job after all. Bills to pay, mouth to feed, and all that boring stuff. I'll update this thumbnail every month for the new amount, but I've just made a £1,000 donation to Calm to get the ball rolling. Each year on the 1st of September, I'll donate 50% of whatever this video has made over that year for as long as this channel continues, which I hope is many, many years to come. Speaking of which, massive thanks to the channel's latest supporters on Patreon. Ian Tully, Duncan Allen, Milan Grekov, Robert Bryden, Naveen Hariprasad, Paul Jameson, Mike Hawke, Scott Cullen, OCD Bomb, and Dave Klatt. And because you've watched this video, you'll have helped increase that donation to Calm too. So literally, thanks for watching. Don't forget to claim your free Audible trial with the link in the description, and I'll catch you next time. Bye for now.